Well, welcome everybody and hello. My name is Allie and I am the founder and leader of the Youth Environmental Action Committee. We are very excited to host our second Teen Nature Night and this time it's through Zoom. Um, our theme for this evening is Creatures of the Deep and we are delighted to have Kristen Erickson from Manatee County Parks and Natural Resources as our guest speaker for the night. So please, um, just some general rules, uh, keep your camera off and please mute your microphone so that we can give Ms. Erickson our full attention. Um, we encourage you to ask questions um, and uh, she can answer them uh, at the end of her presentation and you can leave your questions in the chat box. Um, so without further ado, uh, take it away, Christy. Thank you, Allie. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, as Ali said, I think I've confused everyone with the Kristen Christie. So my real name is Kristen Erickson. Um, everyone has called me Christie since I was a little girl. So either is fine. Um, I am here to talk to you about hydrothermal vents and their endemic critters. And just a little overview here. Um, they asked me to touch a little bit on my education and my career path. And so I'm kind of going to combine those. I hope it's not too confusing because that's kind of what led me into my graduate studies, which is where we get into the fun stuff like the hydrothermal vents uh, and the endemic organisms. And then I'll talk a little bit more about career paths and my current position um, and then see, look at any of the questions. So just so you know, the struggle is real if you are wanting to be a marine biologist and you live in the Midwest in Roscoe, Illinois. As you can see, I was up here surrounded by either the Great Lakes or the other form of water, which I absolutely do not want any part of the snow. So when I graduated high school, I was ready to go and Florida, here I come. <laughs> However, my parents had different ideas. So they had decided that I needed to stay in state for one year and then I could go anywhere I wanted to. And if it was Florida, then I could go to college in Florida. So I thought about this for a little while and I started looking at some schools and I decided I'm gonna go back one that if I lived up here and I wanted to be South, I found Carbondale, Illinois University right down here. And I was as far South and still on the state as I could get. There was nothing my parents could do about it. So I managed to get six and a half hours South, found a four year program with a um, zoology major that I was very excited about and figured whatever, after a year, I'm headed to Florida. The reality is I really enjoyed that campus and I really enjoyed the school. And turns out they had the top, one of the top ranked zoology departments and some really awesome professors. So I decided to stay there, which, um, also in the end allowed me to take advantage of some of the community college um, opportunities and near my hometown that I knew about. And one of those was a field study that um, was taking place in Jamaica, but it was being offered through a very small, um, like I said, community college. So I was excited because this was gonna allow me more of a hands-on experience and really being in the ocean and studying some of these things, but also getting an education on mangrove communities and coastal zones um, and reef systems. And so I was lucky enough that I was able to do that. And I do believe that that field study really helped me get an internship that I applied for while I was doing my undergrad, but during the summer at, in Chicago at the John G. Shedd Aquarium. So while I was there, I was able to um, stock and maintain and monitor water quality for both saltwater and freshwater systems. And I was dealing with public exhibits as well as educational exhibits and um, also dealing with the public and some of the um, school groups that came through. So it was really a, a great experience in terms of leading up to um, a career path for once I graduated. And after this internship, I went back, I think I had one semester left and I did finish up and I did actually graduate. So that put me at a point where it was time to find a job. So I had been in Illinois and I was gonna get make my way to Florida. And I had my first real job in the field of my study. I was at SeaWorld of San Antonio. <laughs> 
So apparently my sense of direction is off a little bit because I still didn't manage to get myself to Florida, but I did manage to get to Texas and I was ecstatic about being a marine mammal trainer. Um, this position was highly com uh, competitive. Uh, the swim test that we had was rigorous and I ended up getting the position. So I was really proud of myself and I absolutely loved teaching the animals behaviors and interacting with the animals throughout the day, working to provide um, enrichment opportunities for them. But I was slowly, slowly starting to realize that my dream job was not exactly what I had expected it to be. And this was really scary, just coming out of undergrad, thinking I'm gonna start my career. Um, I mean, this is what I went to school for. What am I gonna do if I quit my job? And <laughs> where do I go from here? So it was time to regroup. And I started looking for jobs and I found one working as um, a veterinary technician and educator at Loggerhead Park in Juneau Beach, Florida. In case you missed that, I finally made it to Florida. So um, this position really involved educating guests and camp kids that came through the facility, um, as well as working with veterinarians to uh, rehabilitate injured sea turtles and hopefully release them back into the wild. So it was an exciting time and I really enjoyed it because I also was assisting with um, beach nesting surveys and some of the other projects, research projects that were going on with some of the graduate students um, in the area. And of course, I also got to deal with the hatchling recovery and release, which was always exciting. So clearly I loved my job, but I started to realize that now I had been here about four years and in this time frame, I had been helping graduate students with research projects and getting their degrees. So in this amount of time, if I had thought about it, I, I could have ended up with a degree at this point in time where I was just kind of deciding to start over and go back to school. Now, mind you, this was about eight or nine years after my undergrad at this point. So higher education, it is a process. Um, I thought at the time I wanted to go back and continue um, learning more about sea turtles and doing sea turtle research. So I looked to the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, which is the Marine Science School for the College of William and Mary. And I, from working at Loggerhead Park, I knew the name um, Dr. Jack Music, and he was known as pretty much the sea turtle god. He had been researching sea turtles for decades. Um, so I, I ended up having an interview with him in terms of possibly becoming one of his students. And I quickly learned that he really wasn't interested in taking any new students on. And partially that was because he already had 13 of them. So I realized as well that I wouldn't probably get the mentorship that I was looking for at this point. So I ended up doing a few more interviews with different professors at both William and Mary and at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And Dr. Rochelle Seitz ended up being one of them that I, I really enjoyed the interview with her. She seemed very interested in her research. And in the end, she offered me a job in her lab. So I was looking at this as an opportunity to kind of regroup and decide if maybe I wanted to switch um, directions. And she studied blue crabs, oysters, and clams. And so I'd be working in the lab, but I would also be um, working on the tagging project with blue crabs and the data collection on the blue crab dredge and trawl survey projects, which was great during the summer because I was out on the water in the Chesapeake. But that also meant that in the winters, I was out on Chesapeake Bay as well. So in that top picture, you probably can't see, but that was our the vessel that we used for the dredge. And every morning in the winter, we were we were out there November, December, January, and we woke up to having to get up and chip ice off the back of that boat in order to work. So I told you I was trying to get out of Roscoe because of the snow. I wasn't really happy about this, but it was a job and it was time to think and it was time to, it was an opportunity to continue in the field that I wanted to work in. It was also while I was working in this lab that I came about and was introduced to Dr. Cindy Van Dover, who is a hydrothermal vent scientist. And I'm going to give her some major kudos that she deserves, but um, 
I'm sure most of you, the picture at the top, have heard of the Alvin submersible. And Dr. Van Dover is the first and only female Alvin pilot, and she accomplished that in 1990. The first female scientist had been allowed to dive in the Alvin in 1971. So it still took her 20 years and she was still the first and ended up being the only Alvin pilot. She discovered the largest hydrothermal vent system, which uh, runs along the Galapagos Rift. And she wrote the first textbook on the ecology of hydrothermal vents. So I was ecstatic having these interviews with her and talking to her. And I was even more amazed and surprised because she wanted to work with me. So I imagine, you know, you can, you can understand it was a really tough decision for me. Hydrothermal vents in the Pacific Ring of Fire, blue crabs in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, yeah, I was really gonna miss those blue crabs, let me tell you. <laughs> so here's what, where we'll um, switch gears a little bit. Um, and get into the basics of the hydrothermal vents environment. So what are they? These are areas where you have seawater that it starts seeping down into fissures or cracks down into the seafloor. And as it's doing that, it's being modified, that seawater by the, you know, the surrounding rock and um, the magma fluid that it's kind of intermixing with. So in the end, that magma, as it heats up, it begins to rise. And this hot mineral, mineral rich water um, really begins to rise back up and th through the venting system. So it's mixing with that cold ocean water or that ambient temperature. So this plume that comes up of mineral rich superheated water is mixing and cooling, obviously. So as it cools, when you get this this venting that comes up through here, then you get this particle, this mineral fallout that precipitates out. Um, so clearly this isn't happening everywhere you step into the ocean or the Gulf or anywhere. So where and do hydrothermal vents occur and, and more or less why? You're basically looking at spreading centers and subduction zones. So I'm simplifying this a bit. But your venting really occurs in mainly two types where plate tectonic movement is happening. And the first are at mid-ocean ridges or spreading centers. And um, in this image, you can see um, the two arrows. So the plates are spreading apart. And in doing so, they're obviously they're pulling the continental crust away from each other. And you have seawater again seeping down, but you also have that molten mantle, mantle rising up. And these areas are really interesting um, because as that rises up, because those plates are coming apart, this is where you constantly have new oceanic crust or seafloor being built. And that happens, it's right there at that center. So as it pulls apart, you're, you know, you're constantly making that. And so you have, you're, you're constantly making new stuff in the new seafloor in the middle, but as it pulls apart and continues to pull apart, you have older seafloor that's you know, just off to the side from it. So these systems are really um, interesting as mid-ocean ridges. Then you also have um, subduction zones or areas, and this is where trenches typically form. And in my mind, subduction zones are really kind of like the Earth's most giant crash scenes, but in super slow motion because you have areas where plates are pushing together and they're pushing so hard and with so much force that one plate eventually subducts under the other one. So you can imagine you have this subducting down and it's getting, it's getting heated and it's melting here in this magma. So when, before I, I, so when you have that subduction, you have that trench that forms basically right right along you know there's like a gap where it subducts and then you have that overriding plate i'm sure most of you have heard of the mariana trench which is about seven miles deep so you understand the amount of force and pressure and subduction that's going on in these areas but the subduction zones are especially interesting in my mind because Subduction of a plate down into that molten mat mantle really alters the thermal and chemical structure of the upper mantle because 
um, it mixes those elements that are normally going to be sequestered in this oceanic crust and this lithosphere area. So the subduction process, if you think about it, really is um, it's created most of the Earth's continental crust, if that makes sense. You have subduction going on. It's then coming back up, venting, and creating more of the continental crust. So in reality, you have venting going on and you have high hydrothermal vent ecosystems, but due to the mixing of ele elements and the different types of you know, subduction versus the um, spreading centers, they really, these areas really differ very uh, quite a lot from each other. So this is where we, I mean, these environments are crazy anyway. So you can only imagine the life of a vent organism. And the way I see it is they live in near boiling temperatures. I mean, they can be as high as 800 degrees Fahrenheit. They eat toxic chemicals for breakfast. They bear the weight of the ocean on their shoulders. The, the Pescadero Basin vents, I believe, are still the deepest at 12,500 feet in the Pacific Ocean. You imagine the immense amount of pressure that these organisms have at that depth. And then of course, they never ever see the light of day. They're always in complete darkness. So th these organisms are crazy, but what, what did I actually mean referring to them eating toxic chemicals for breakfast? We all, I would say most of us are going to, when we think of primary production, you're thinking photosynthesis. Well, not in the vent environments. This diagram might look a little, uh, a little bit scary, but really all I'm trying to show here is that the chemosynthetic reactions that are going on are parallel to those of the photosynthetic. The exception is that the chemosynthetic energy source is generated from a, a chemical reaction, oxidation. So the photosynthetic is from that solar energy and that's the reaction that takes place. So these, the base of the food chain, they're eating toxic chemicals for breakfast. And I say that because sulfur in the form of hydrogen sulfide is energy rich, but it's a deadly molecule. So the bacteria that can utilize this as an energy source are obviously very important at vents as they do serve as the base of the food chain. Um, you think of them basically as the photosynthetic plants that we're, we're used to. Um, and this is kind of an aside, but it's one thing that um, Dr. Van Dover always really kind of drove into my head because most people think of chemosynthesis in those environments is a complete separate, um, a, a separate process uh, from photosynthesis and it is. However, I wanted to point out the reason you, I have that arrow pointing from the O2 that is created in photosynthesis is part of this chemosynthetic process here. So we are still utilizing something that comes from the photic zone in order to have a chemosynthetic environment. Now, <clears throat> I'm not gonna get into it because it's a little much, but there is, and this is what I was just talking about is the aerobic chemosynthesis. There is anaerobic chemosynthesis and it depends on other things. It doesn't utilize that oxygen. And so it is independent from photosynthesis. So just if down the road you hear that, I don't want you to think I gave you misinformation, but that's a more um, complicated process. <laughs> so those really cool microbes, the chemo um, autotrophic bacteria, as I said, they are the base of the food chain. And they are down there in two different forms. So you have free living bacteria and you have symbionts of invertebrate hosts. So those symbionts are also, um, they have two different ways of providing energy to the host. You have endosymbionts and these are organisms that live within the body or the cell of another organism. Similar to the bottom photo there is a Riftia species of tube worm. And the symbionts that are found um, there in that worm are in the trophosome, which that trophosome is specialized and essentially it replaces the mouth and the gut of the worm. So that trophosome houses the, the symbionts that produce the energy for the host. So um, it, it's really those, those red plumes 
collect what they need, move it down into the bacteria or to the trophosome area, and then those symbionts are able to produce the energy. Now you also have episymbionts, and these are not within the body or the cell, but they are still on the, the animal. And this Rumicara shrimp, the photo on the top, um, they have episymbionts that are found on what they have special appendages, and there's um, the symbionts on those, and then the Episymbionts are also found on the like the inner surface of the their gill chamber, and so these are highly specialized um, endemic creatures to the hydrothermal vents. I also wanted to point out that some of these invertebrates, while they may use the symbionts, um, such as this Ephemeria snail, some of these organisms can actually feed free 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 feed <laughs> on the. Um, like the bacterial mats and the free living bacteria. So this snail will be able to crawl around on the chimney or down at the base. And if it comes across bacterial mats or places of bacteria, it's grazing and it's consuming these free living bacteria. However, they also um, house these um, bacteriocytes in their gill filament. So the bottom picture with the area, area uh, with the arrow, they're showing you there's individual little um, gill filaments in there. And along those gill filaments, you have bacteriocytes and bacteria are in them. And as the water flows through the gills, they're exposed, they expose the bacteria to um, the inorganics that they need to then produce the um, food or energy for the organism. So now that you have a basic understanding of the vents and their organisms, I'm going to kind of revert back to starting um, my graduate program, which so pretty much my first task as a master's student was to hop on a flight to Fiji. I thought I was probably a good start and definitely uh, excited about that. So during that first research cruise, we went to Fiji, it was in the Lao Basin, and I was basically tasked with assisting in any way, shape, or form with the data collection, the um, data logging and um, sorting, and but also conducting and summarizing a literature review of the back arc basins in the Manus Basin of Papua New Guinea. And I needed to um, summarize this and publish this information for a mining company. Um, the third thing that was also suggested during this trip by my advisor is to really get a handle on how these cruises work and begin studying the um, muscle ecology at hydrothermal vents and prepare a research question. So that is what I did. And I was able to complete all of those tasks, but I wanted to point out that the Lao Basin research cruise was really a, a great introduction for me. And I just wanted to point out the you know immense amount of work. The, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute is actually the ones that provided the, the main scientists and um, with the research vessel, the Melville, and also provided us our means of sampling, which was by way of the ROV um, Jason. Um, but what you might not expect is that um, most of the tools, so the pictures that you see at the bottom, the tools that we were using to actually collect these specimens were most of them were made and engineered by the scientists that were on board. And that would change um, from research crews to, or, you know, to crews because it really depended on what you were trying to collect. And at times you would, you'd have the RV down there, you'd be trying to collect something, it wasn't gonna work. And you, you, know, you had to sit back and pretty much become an engineer and figure out how to design something and put it together. And I think the best example is the picture on the left um, it's called a muscle pot. And all it is is a kitchen pot turned upside down and engineered with a T handle. And this was something that my advisor also created. And it worked really well for the, those muscle um, collections. And basically, the ROV arm that you see on the far right hand picture there picking up one of the, the rocks, you need stuff that 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 arm can actually utilize. So it would push the, the pot down into the muscle bed. And in that inside, in that second picture there, you can see there's a canvas bag. So we kind of, we had a, a, a rope that we strung through it. And when 
it, the pot was pushed down on the muscles, the arm could twist that T and it would close that bag. And then the whole pot would be, the arm would pick it up and put it down into a bucket basically. So, you know, these are just some of the things that I had to start thinking about in terms of what I was gonna need and what my research project was gonna be. So after a few months back at the office and thinking about all of this, I definitely had some questions. And one of them was kind of big in my mind and it was how am I gonna pay for the rest of my college semesters here? <laughs> And the reason I bring up the funding is because when I got back, I realized that the Manus Backark Basin Literature Review that I had been asked to complete had been funded by an outside organization. And it was Nautilus Minerals, this company that wanted to go into the basin and start getting, um, doing some mining and getting some um, core samples. And I started to think about it. I realized that after doing that literature review, no one knew that area or what was in the area better than me. So I spoke to my advisor and she agreed. And I came up and I wrote up a proposal. I submitted it to them and basically said, hey, you should fund my research project, AKA you should fund me. <laughs> and the company agreed. So they ended up paying for my tuition, all of my research, um, the cruises, my flights, as well as my um, advisor and administrative costs that is, that's on the school end of things. So while that literature review really put me in a good place, it boils down to don't, being, don't be afraid to speak up when you, when you get into these situations. And um, I also decided that I wanted to talk to my advisor because in doing so, I didn't want to do um, deep sea muscle ecology research. I had looked into it. There seemed to be quite a lot going on that was already published. And so she agreed to let me um, kind of regroup and think that out. So be, not being afraid to speak up, that's how I ended up in Papua New Guinea on the mining vessel, the DP Hunter. And in these pictures, just wanted to point out to give you an idea of size, yes, that is a helicopter pad on the top of that um, vessel. And yes, I did get to go on quite a few helicopter rides. So it was really cool to see that area from above. And so getting more to the research, I dealt with active hydrothermal vents, but I ended up gearing up more towards the inactive chimneys. And the reason I was doing that is because these mining companies were starting to target inactive vent areas um, due to there was such a, a commercially valuable ore that's found in the seabed <clears throat> due to that subduction zone that we were talking about they had found that there's typically about 10 times the amount of mineable, mineable gold in these seafloors at these inactive vent areas where there's subduction zones. Um, but they had been elite, elusive pretty much up until this point. And I say that in that now they were looking at the Manus Basin and because it was relatively speaking only 5,000 feet deep, this was going to make it technologically and economically feasible for them to start mining in these areas. So in doing so, what I got out of it is they were taking this vessel out there and they were going to dangle like a spaghetti string, a mile of drilling pipe from the bottom or the deck of the vessel. So this is a little hard to see, but I'm, I drew some arrows so you can get an idea. Basically, this is the drill pipe. And the way they put this together was they, they had that big red, this area up here would lower this pipe down. And then they would hold it at the deck of the boat, obviously with equipment. And then this back here is all more drilling pipe and they would couple it together. So once they got it to the deck level, they would grab another piece of pipe from the pile. This machine would pick it up. They'd couple it down here and then lower this back down and again, get another pipe. And so you can only imagine um, doing a mile of this pipe took, it was quite a process and it took about 12 hours to assemble. And it took just as long, if not longer to disassemble this. So, it was kind of a hairy situation when they did decide to go down, you know, to put this pipe down to the seafloor. 
And to demonstrate that one evening, it was, I think it was about one o'clock in the morning and the, all the alarms on this vessel started going off. Every, it was completely pitch black and you heard the engine completely stop. Usually this isn't as big of a deal because you have generators, but for some reason, apparently their generators were not working and did not kick on. These vessels aren't anchored. They are held in position by basically four en engines that well, even when that drilling is going on and they're stationary, they're stationary because those motors are holding them in place. So when, when this vessel lost power, that meant we couldn't control the, the vessel and they had a good portion, I think it was like three quarters of this pipe dangling from the bottom of this vessel. And of course, we were going exactly where we wanted, to, didn't want to, not fast, but we were slowly moving into shallower waters. And it was, it was, everyone was scrambling because they were really worried that they were going to break off this giant pipe. And obviously they're also going to take out the bottom seafloor as well. So they got lucky just before we were almost to the point where we were too shallow, the generators were able, they did kick back on. And obviously it, it saved their entire rig. And it was quite an experience um, <laughs> watching all that go on. So anyway, that was just a fun story, but this is a visual of the, down in the seafloor where the pipe is actually drilling. And this is that ROV arm. So they were using this to kind of hold things in place when they needed to. And then this was actually the drill bit that they used and that center part was the core. So they could drill down, take a core sample, shoot it back up that drill pipe, get their core sample and send another one back down. So when they weren't using the ROV to collect their samples, we were looking for venting areas and looking to collect some of the organisms in that area. So here's just an example of some of the little beasties that we would find at active vents. Um, you see we have uh, sea cucumbers that these are somewhat similar to what we have in the shallower waters, but over on the upper left, you see that purple swimming sea cucumber, which they were absolutely beautiful. They weren't typically in the venting area. They were kind of a little more passerby, but we did see quite a few of those in the area and they were really cool. Um, you also had scale worms, their type of polychaete worm and um, some shrimp, but the biomass dominant organisms were those Ephraeria snails and the Alvinaconca snails and um, barnacles were as well. And it was kind of cool. I don't know if you can really see it, but these alvinaconca snails down here, they look, they call them the hairy snails, but when you feel them, they actually, they're almost like Velcro. They're like a, a real bristly Velcro feeling. So they were, they were pretty cool. Um, we also had the occasional um, passerby that was really cool. Um, we saw quite a few deep sea octopus down there. These are not the ones, there is um, one um, octopus that is uh, endemic to the hydrothermal vents. I believe it's a uh, volcano octopus species. And as far as I know, it's the only octopus species. And I believe it's the only cephalopod that they've found that seems to be endemic to hydrothermal vents. So that was cool. This was not one of those. And I, so I don't have a picture of them, but they're, they're cool little critters. And then this was, an awesome picture. We had a chimera that was sw would swim around these black smokers pretty often. And they're just, they're an amazing deep sea creature to see. Um, they're similar to, they fall in the um, shark skates and ray family, if you're not familiar. So <clears throat> now we kind of talk about more of that inactive chimney habitat that I was talking about. If you think about it, eventually that venting, that hydrothermal venting is going to stop at an inact, um, then you have that inactive chimney. And that means it's no longer hospitable for vent endemic fauna. Um, so we were kind of looking at, well, does anything move into this area or what kind of critters move into there? Because when you look, they do seem to have a relatively high biomass relatively speaking. I think most people know you have deep sea organisms, but they're sparse. They're not high density throughout the deep sea. And I think in this picture here, these are, you can see some shrimp all around this um, inactive. 
And then these are some stalked barnacles. I know they're a little harder to see. And that's what we found is that if you, um, you take a closer look at these inactive chimneys, you end up finding a lot of life. I mean, there were big anemones that were, um, you know, stalked. You can see hanging on inactive chimneys, even that had toppled over. And you know, you, it, it really was a good start, I guess, for for me to see and um, really think about my my research questions because I ended up doing the first deliberate biological study of inactive chimneys. And what we were finding is that there was high biomass in these areas. We found sponges, hydroids, um, there were tube worms, and, and there were tunicates, crinoids, sea stars. Um, there, there really was all kinds of biomass and you had mining companies that seemed to be kind of passing this stuff off as dead, desolate, deep sea areas with very limited um, biomass. So why not mine it? <clears throat> um, so just to, to prove my point a little bit more, these are some more examples of the other little beasties that are at the inactive chimneys. And I wanted to point out that this is interesting, the little circle up there, these are Galatheid crabs. And those were both found at hydrothermal vents and the active ones and these inactive um, sulfide mounds. So they were kind of cool. And another one, I really wish I had a better picture, but these are um, lollipop sponges and they're a glass sponge. And they're, most of them are about a, maybe an inch tall. So they have these real delicate little stems and a tiny little lollipop head kind of like with a with little like sunbursts coming off of them. And they were really cool. But you have, you have all kinds of crabs and um, you have uh, corals and uh, you know, stalked barnacles were there. And I mean, these were, this is just kind of sampling of what we found. And so my objective was to characterize the invertebrate competition at uh, composition, excuse me, at inactive chimneys, which essentially meant specimen collection um, and identification. And I was also going to try to determine if chemoautotrophic microbes that were, or were the primary producers at inactive systems, similar to how they are at the active systems. And this would be using stable isotope analysis. So without getting into too much detail um, about the stable isotopes, what my research showed was that the sulfur isotope data did indicate that, yes, the microbial uh, chemoautotrophic production may really be a major supplement to the photosynthetically derived um, organic material that was also available in these areas. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but basically what this said to me and for our research was that people have been enamored and intrigued with hydrothermal vents. Um, it's such a, you know, a, a unique environment and we don't know anything about it and they use chemosynthesis for their primary production. And now we had research that was showing that these inactive chimneys, these sulfide mounds, were still utilizing photosynthetic material, but they were also utilizing chemosynthetically derived matter. And so these inactive and active environments were way more similar in each other than previously thought. Um, and again, you now have mining companies kind of targeting these areas. So it was scary, but I was really happy to have the data. Um, I completed my research, uh, presented my thesis and published my findings. I did graduate. <laughs> And I was finding myself now uh, going from this super awesome experience to really needing to get back to reality and finding another job. So I bring this up as well because I wanted to point out that working your way to your professional career or you know, your career path, don't be afraid to um, kind of step off to some side jobs and have a little fun. When I finished, I had actually been asked to participate in one more um, research cruise. And I was just going to be assisting. So it was going to be kind of a relief. I didn't have all the pressure of trying to get everything um, accomplished. And I decided to go ahead and do it. And this one was really cool and was going to take me to the Gulf of Mexico, but we'd be studying cold seeps and brine pools, which that's a whole other world. And I would really like to get into it. And I don't have time, I don't think, to get into this type of venting and this type of habitat. but. Brine pools are 
just super cool. And if you have time, you should read about them and get a little better understanding of them because they, they really are amazing to see and experience. And I also just wanted to point out, since we're doing deep sea stuff, I wanted to point out these weird little alien creatures. <laughs> um, this guy is a giant isopod, but um, if you look, we had some of them, they start out really, really tiny and they get bigger and bigger. And we would see mounds of them down on the seafloor and usually all mounded together. And what I've realized since is that they, they were definitely scavenging and eating things. They're a very important deep sea scavenger. And they were probably the, just the most unique uh, weird critter that I saw. And um, these cold seeps also have their own type of tube worm that you find. And that was one of their main research um, specimens down there that they were looking into. Um, I also just realized that I, I didn't really have a good picture of how, where all the tools and um, our methods for collecting the, um, the specimens and the bacterial mats. And this is kind of a, this is like a good picture of it here. And I don't know if you noticed, but this right here is that muscle pot I was talking about. So they were using the same thing that my um, advisor invented in these cold seeps. And then these were used for different bacterial mats and core samples. And I don't, I don't know if you can see it, but this was really interesting. This right here, if I remember correctly, is um, actually they, a vacuum. They were able to vacuum up some of the bacterial mats. They wanted just a thin layer on the top when they didn't necessarily, when they weren't able to get some of the core samples. So there's some real inventive stuff going on here. But I also took a little side job. Um, I had the opportunity to conduct aerial surveys for threatened and endangered species um, pretty close to Bermuda. So we left from, I think we left uh, from Fernandia Beach and flew out in this smaller little plane. And the Navy had, um, they were going to reenact the USS Cole bombing. I don't know if any of you remember that, but basically one of these vessels, the USS Cole had a Zodiac pull up next to it and they detonated it. It was a terrorist act, blew a huge hole in the side of the vessel. Um, the U.S. was um, completely caught off guard. So the Navy um, was going to reenact the same thing, have an actual explosion using the USS Nicholas vessel. And um, that's one of them that you see there in the water. So while we were up there, we actually got to see them blow up the side of this vessel. But clearly we had been there to um, make sure federal laws were um, uh, we were in compliance and we needed to make sure that there weren't any threatened or endangered marine mammals or um, sea turtles for that matter. So that was also a cool experience. I will say most people or a lot of people can't handle small plane aerial surveys. You definitely, you, you got to be ready to do some banking in those to do your transects, but it was a great experience. Um, I also decided at one point to go ahead and take a, a job and assist with some Everglades fish sampling that was being done. I know this is kind of ironic, but that meant I also had to take, I believe it was a, uh, called the S-274 helicopter crew member training in order to do this in the Everglades. And I know it sounds a little strange, but that's me driving the airboat in the bottom right hand picture, but we couldn't always get to our sample sites in the airboats. And when we couldn't, they had a helicopter that would come pick us up, take us over to the site. We'd trudge through the swampy Everglades, collect our samples and get back into the helicopter. So, you know, nothing like having a certification as a helicopter crew member. <laughs> So I was really happy that I took that time and did these things. So when I finally settled in, um, I worked for a little over five years for the Southeast Fisheries Science Center down in Miami, which is um, part of NIMS or NOAA. And I was taken into um, a lab but we, in Miami, but we were working out of Key Largo. So we were looking at the um, Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and we were collecting data and doing coral growth on um, 
uh, we're doing coral growth and disease monitoring on both palmata um, and cervicornis um, corals while we were there. So then I moved on and I did some work with FWC and I was working for the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. We were creating coral nurseries and coral gardens and then transplanting these coral fragments in areas to try to establish um, you know, new coral thickets uh, in areas that had either been drastically reduced in size and number or trying to put them in areas where they thought they would be um, doing well. And so um, currently, I feel like there should be a drum roll at this point, I'm working for Manatee County um, as the Marine Resources Coordinator and our section is responsible for constructing and monitoring artificial reefs in the Gulf of Mexico. So I'm gonna pull this up and hopefully you can see it. I think it's gonna pull up here. But if you Google Manatee County artificial reefs, um, you'll get a main page that gives you a little more information about our 13 artificial reefs and kind of how we site these areas and what we're looking for in terms of material. Um, and then there's a little section where you can click on videos and pictures, which I think is what most people are interested. So this takes you to the story maps of the artificial reefs that we have. And as you scroll down, you can keep scrolling or what you have here is you can look at the different um, reef sites that we have and click on them to um, just jump to a certain one. And then you can see on the map here, um, we have the, um, all of the reefs marked and we have a little legend here that you can look at. But I wanted to touch on our most recent um, deployments were at both the Borden and the Bridge Reef here. The Borden Reef, we've been trying to mimic the most natural environment we can, so we're only deploying limestone boulders. And so just to give you a quick overview here, this is a barge load that we took out there. So this is probably about 500 tons of limestone. And we typically try to get pieces that are between 1,500 and uh, five, uh, like 3,000 pounds. They have to be um, larger than 500 pounds, but obviously we're going for bigger and better. And uh, this, um, this machine obviously pull, drops them in individually or a couple at a time. So it's a little bit of a pro uh, process. And just to kind of cool, we have a side scan sonar on our boat. So if you click on these, you can zoom in. And this is imagery of the seafloor in these permitted reef sites. So you can see we've deployed quite a few um, piles of limestone down here, which that hard bottom is very scarce in the Gulf of Mexico, which is why we are creating these artificial reefs. And just as an idea of another deployment, this was something pretty unique for us. This is a barge right here that was donated um, by Jim Logan, who helped deploy some of that limestone on the Borden Reef. He donated this and his time and um, energy to, to get the barge out there and sink it. So you can see here, the end of the barge, they have filled with water and this end needs to be filled. So they moved this crane over and their pumping station but we have some video of it. I just thought I'd show you quickly here. This is when it's getting a little bit closer, but on this YouTube video, you get a better idea. Might be a little bit choppy here, but this is that big crane being moved over back around to the other side of the barge so they could fill it with water. I think you can see here, we were terrified because we thought we were gonna get run over by a giant storm. We were very lucky and it missed us. And then that's one of those guys is Jim Logan, the, the one that donated the barge, kind of having a final walkthrough before they sank that last um, portion of the, of the barge. And I'm gonna show you one more just because this is just as the barge starts to, um, disappear. Oops. 
So you can see here, there's just that little bit that's left and it's sinking. I don't know what most of you have in mind in terms of thinking about sinking barges, but we really, we did have a few problems that seemed to slow things down, but we thought that we were gonna have this barge sank in a few hours. This was a good 10 hour day. It, it was a process and it took a while, but it was really exciting when we finally get that um, barge deployed there. So it was, it was exciting. And if we scroll down that bridge site, reef site, we also have culvert that we've deployed there. And there's another little video that we have of the culverts, just to give you an idea of how these are all, how the operations work and kind of why they take a little while. This is a forklift because these are so large and you don't want to crush them or crack them. You, we pretty much deploy them individually over the side of the barge. And so this is just a video where I'll let you watch it. You can see the culvert um, just being deployed, how it falls down into the water. So, and show you here. Wanted to scroll down just a little bit for another picture. So these are the big ones you just saw that were being deployed. And obviously we do have some smaller ones. And another cool idea that helps us a lot with better fish habitat, if you look in here, sometimes we put some of those smaller ones into the um, larger culvert there. So with that, um, I guess if anyone has any questions, I will try my best to answer them. And I don't know if Allie had anything she wanted to interject at this point as well. Um, I have my contact information up there. If anyone has um, any questions after the fact that they want to talk to me, I'd be more than happy to um, talk to you about it. All right. So does anybody have any questions? Go ahead and drop them in the chat now. And uh, just a, a show of uh, hands on the reaction. How many of you knew we even had reefs off this part of Florida? Hey, folks. Awesome, awesome. Well, one of the cool things is if any of you get your dive certification, it's um, the really neat sites to go dive as well. And you can find all the GPS coordinates on the county website for the artificial reefs. All right, um, I'm not seeing any questions. So um, with that, I'm, oh, wait, we have one from Allie. Um, so do scientists have a population estimate of any hydrothermal vent organisms? Um, I, I mean, they do. The question is, have we found all the hydrothermal vents? So, I mean, I don't know what it is. I, I have not, um, I haven't kept up with information like that. However, the active vents that have been studied are, are definitely um, very well known. The organisms are, are well known. An idea of numbers, you, you get um, usually where you have more venting at the black smokers, you'll have more um, biomass and it peters off a little bit with the cooler ones which is really kind of where you get into those cold seeps as well. There's still a type of venting. They're just cooler water. Um, if, I, if I remember correctly, I think a cold, the cold seeps are typically under 100, anything under 140 degrees of water, but typically they're cooler. But getting back to the organisms, um, they, have, they have a much better handle on the active vents. I would say that they do not on the inactive areas. I hope I didn't overwhelm everybody. No, I was no, trying no. to keep it basic, but trying to keep it interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so we did have an, uh, one more question. If Have you ever do dove the um, Steerton area? I, it, uh, um, Ali says it's the only hydrothermal vent you can dive to. I haven't, it's not one I've heard of. Um, I have not heard of that either. Um, I have not done any diving in, in without a submersible. <laughs> 
because everything I, the shallowest area I was in was that um, Manus Basin, that five uh, five thousand foot area. So obviously that wasn't going to happen. But I think maybe similar to what Ali's talking about is when uh, I didn't get into all of this, but obviously if I was going to be doing research in Fiji and in Papua New Guinea while I was there, I was going to take some time after the fact and really do some um, you know, exploring and traveling. I love traveling. So this was a lot of adventure area for me. And one of the places that um, a local in Papua New Guinea took me out to, it was an area that is known for their black sand beaches. And these black sand beaches um, are in an area like a, it was a harbor in a sense. And the minute you walked in to the water, you could see the bubbles rising and you could feel how it was like a hot tub. And granted being in Papua New Guinea, and this is a slightly different situation. I don't know that you'd be allowed to do this in the US, but we had people with us and we were out swimming around in it. And you had venting going on that you could feel right at your feet. And you, you would literally start getting so close that it was getting too hot to be near and you would back off from it. So. I'm going to assume that that's something similar, but these um, these venting areas like that are typically that back arc basin, kind of that subduction zone areas, because that's where you're going to have shallower um, venting occurring versus those um, spreading centers that are more mid ocean ridge areas and are going to be much deeper. Do you want me to stop sharing my screen and sh share me or is this okay? <laughs> No, um, I was just going to say, I think you're good, okay. um, but I just wanted to say thank you, Kristen, for that amazing presentation. Um, we are so thankful that you could come here this evening to talk to us about your research and your work with hydrothermal vents and the organisms that live there. Um, and we also just wanted to thank um, all of you guys, the attendants for... Oh, Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> um, tuning in and being such a great audience. Um, we hope to have you back for future events that the Youth Environmental Action Committee hosts. You can follow us on social media at yeek underscore manatee to hear about other virtual or in-person events that we might hold. Um, and if you're interested in being a part of our organization or learning more a bit about who we are and what we're about, um, please contact our email, which is uh, yeek manatee so y-e-a-c manatee at gmail.com and if you have any other questions for Kristen um, that you want to ask after the presentation um, her email is obviously right there but we hope you have a great night and thank you guys for joining us thank you so much thank you thank you you guys thank you for participating all right have a nice evening everyone you too bye-bye